can everybody hear me okay with this uh, with this mic? Great. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is a little bit rough. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about probabilistic programming and inference compilation, uh, or um, effectively how I learned to stop worrying and love deep neural networks. So, as Martin said, I work in machine learning, and I was recently asked to go to Japan to represent the UK as an AI slash machine learning expert, and one of the, the, the corporations that we went to had their, their media up and, and you know, they, they had their sort of design, uh, design brochures of what they can offer and so on and so forth, and their impression of what machine learning is today was machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. Okay? Uh, you should laugh at that. That's supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> uh, <coughs> there is much, much more to machine learning than, than, than deep learning. Uh, 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 and one of the things that's, I think, most interesting that's, uh, that's coming up in the field of machine learning right now is probabilistic programming. Um, so how many of you are familiar with probabilistic programming? Oh, boy, this is great. So I've heard, actually, that, that probabilistic programming is making more of an impact in the programming languages community uh, right now than it is even in the machine learning community. But I think it's at the intersection where things are going to get really interesting. So let me give you my take on what probabilistic programming is, even though there's a lot of familiarity in the audience, much more so than in a machine learning audience, which is nice. So I think of probabilistic programming as being at the intersection of pr this community, pr the programming languages community, the statistics community, the machine learning community, where we share algorithms and inference and and, and, and uh, compilers and language techniques uh, to, to bring them together in, in, in interesting and powerful ways. Intuitively, what I think of uh, when I think of probabilistic programming, I think of it like, like this. In computer science, typically we write programs that have some sort of free variables or parameters whose values are provided, then we execute the program to produce some output. In statistics, which is a large part of my background, instead we have some data that we're interested in, which we're interested, and in, data is always going to be Y, or observations are going to be Y for me, and we'd like to describe the data and, uh, and under, uh, we'd like to model the data and and say something about latent parameters or or latent variables of interest, and those are going to be X. And the way we do this is we write down some typically write down some sort of uh, abstract model in terms of a mathematical denotation, this often is a generative model, but not necessarily always, uh, that when given some setting of the latent variables, executes forward and generates the data. The problem is, of course, that what we're given is the output. Uh, uh, we write down some sort of model in some sort of uh, uh, mathematical denotation, and we have to get backwards to say something about the latent variables x of interest. So what I think when I my definition of probabilistic programming is <clears throat> basically doing statistics using the tools in computer science, which is to say to replace this abstract ma uh, mathematical, de this mathematical denotation of some sort of abstract generative model with the text of a program, code. Right? Uh, and here we're going to observe the output of the program, and we'd like to do something to get information about the parameters of the program. Uh, that would have given rise to the observations were you to execute the program with those, with those values. So the tools that we're going to use for that are the tools of inference. Okay? So when I talk about evaluation models for probabilistic programs, so on and so forth, what we're going to do is, for a particular program, instead of running it forward, we're, we're, we're effectively going to run it backwards uh, to, give <coughs> to, to, to characterize the posterior distribution of the unknowns given the, uh, the observations uh, why? Okay. So what's a probabilistic program look like? Thanks to Andy Gordon, who stole the uh, paper title Probabilistic Programming for All Times. Okay, you can laugh at that too. Yeah, it's supposed to be funny. Great. <coughs> probabilistic programs are usual or functional or usual functional or imperative programs with a couple of added constructs. The very usual construct, namely random variable value generation, the ability to draw values at random from distributions, and the ability to condition values of variables in a program via observations. And this one sometimes catches people out because it's the evaluation model of performing inference, i.e. this conditioning operation that really distinguishes probabilistic programming from, from traditional uh, programming languages uh, or uh, program evaluators. The goal of the community is, uh, is, a, is a bit 
you could argue that it's either crazy or really cool or really powerful or it's some, something like that. The goal is, is basically, in some sense, to commodify inference. And this is the standard, standard goal of computer science, uh, which is to say that if we can build some sort of abstraction layer, and you know better than I do, uh, that the best way to do that is to define or, uh, some language, right? So if we can build, uh, if, if basically we can s make a model specification language or a model and inference problem denotation language, then this forms some sort of abstraction barrier between people who write models and simulators up here uh, and people who work on evaluators that perform Bayesian inference down here, okay? Uh, so... <clears throat> Today I'll talk a fair amount about, about this, uh, but let's see where, where we go next. There are some success stories. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Bugs or Stan? Okay, so if this were a statistics audience, uh, three quarters of you would have put your hands on. Uh, how about over here with factory and infer.net? Obviously Jason's gonna put, okay. If this were a machine learning audience, three quarters of you would put your hands up for this. Sorry, the Dyna isn't up here, Jason. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Okay, so let's, let's look at what these languages look like and, and think about what's going on and then, and then drive towards the kind of languages that I work on. Um, so just to, just to say it right up front, I've got a lot, of, lot to get through, so I wanna, wanna put it out there. Roughly speaking, there are kind of two ways that you could go about making a probabilistic programming language. One, you could identify some inference algorithm and then restrict a language such that the language only generates models that can be solved or in which inference can be formed performed using that particular algorithm, or you can use a, a regular unrestricted language, whatever that means, and then see what you can do, okay? so. All of these, and in fact, the vast majority of languages up until maybe the, the, the mid-2010s um, uh, are languages that are designed to, res to be restricted such that a particular inference algorithm will work. So bugs is arguably still the most widely used probabilistic programming language. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, a bugs program looks something like this, and you can more or less read this, this, this off. There's some model block, there's some bindings for the free variables A, B, C here, and there's a data block which binds values for Y here. Uh, and you can read this, you can evaluate this program in a couple of different ways, right? Uh, you can execute it like normal, so you can say X is a, is a value drawn from a normal distribution with mean A and precision one over B, and then you can evaluate this loop just as you would normally do. But in a, in a block up here above, I actually know the values for Y. Okay? So the evaluation model for this is to say, what's the posterior distribution? What does this program mean? It says, what's the posterior distribution of X given the values of Y, A, B, and C? Okay? Now, uh, you can also choose to evaluate this program by uh, constructing the corresponding graphical model. Okay? So how many of you are familiar with graphical model notation? Okay. Uh, 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 enough. There won't be a lot of it, but basically you can imagine that there's some x, there are some y's that are dependent on that x, and you've got some variables here, and we have in machine learning and statistics algorithms that we know how to perform inference in graphs like this, provided that the, the, the functions on these edges are deterministic. Uh, uh, we can go off and apply generic inference algorithms to solve for the posterior distribution of unobserved variables given observed variables. So the evaluator, the evaluator for bugs doesn't actually run the program, it actually constructs this graphical model and then runs Gibbs sampling, okay? But in order for a generic Gibbs kernel to, to be applicable, we need to restrict the language, which bugs is restricted, which is in some, some relatively sensible ways, bounded loops, no branching, such that the model class that comes out of all possible execution of bugs programs is uh, that have finite graphical models, i.e. graphical models with a finite number of nodes. Okay? Great. Stan. Okay, how many of you have used Stan or are familiar with Stan? Many fewer here. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so Stan is, <coughs> uh, you could argue, a, a, a modernization of bugs. It's extremely popular in statistics now and very powerful. So it basically takes the bugs language uh, and, and, and adds one more restriction such, a, such that you can use a particular inference algorithm that is, that is particularly powerful, namely Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So here, again, is a, a code block in, in Stan, and let's take a look at what this, what this code is. Again, we're going to bind the values of Ys somewhere uh, uh, up here. Uh, so we have some parameters. These are the, 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 the 
the, the variables whose posterior we're interested in. And then the model reads like this, x is distributed normally, then for t equals two to t, x at that t is normally distributed as a linear uh, update of the previous value of x plus some noise. And then there are normally distributed uh, uh, observations given the value of x at a particular time t, okay? How many of you, just, just to gauge, it's a small audience, don't, 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 don't be shy. How many of you know what this model is, just reading it right now? Anybody, I know Jason, you're going to know what it is. Uh, anybody want to, anybody want to shout it out? It's a, it's a, actually a Kalman smoother, a linear dynamical system. It's a smoother, exactly, but yes, it's a Kalman filter. I would say Kalman filter almost every time. Yeah, great. So this is a Kalman filter, and if you're in machine learning or machine, uh, if you're in machine learning or statistics, this just jumps out just jumps out at you. You know what it is. It, it doesn't, you know, if I ask that same question to a statistics audience, basically everyone knows what, knows the answer. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what's interesting here? So again, we have the same kind of language restrictions, except there's even one more. Namely, there are no discrete random variables allowed. Okay, whoops, that's, that's, that's a big restriction. However, what you get for that is that you can do in, uh, in a particular kind of inference called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which relies very heavily on reverse mode automatic differentiation. Hello, programming languages, okay? So if you make that, that restriction, the bugs restrictions, plus the, the no discrete random variables, then you have an automatic way of getting this particular derivative, which is essential for very, very rapid inference uh, in uh, finite graphical models with with no discrete random variables. Okay, great. So that's the first place where programming languages really pops up, okay? So there are a lot of probabilistic programming languages, and I apologize, many of you have probably uh, worked on, on languages that aren't, aren't, aren't here, but uh, I would say that <laughs> there have been contributions which could be called probabilistic programming languages from pro the programming languages community, the artificial intelligence community, the machine learning community, the statistics community. And uh, effectively, it's the names of a bunch of the languages show up where they first appeared in the literature. But I would argue that um, uh, <laughs> there's a, a principal distinction uh, uh, that I've started to indicate by shading here, which is that the stuff that's shaded uh, has restricted the language in such a way as to make the, the, the language compatible with some sort of efficient inference scheme. Over here, generally speaking, it's exact inference and counting, and over here it's something like Gibbs sampling or Hamilton and Monte Carlo or something like that where you've explicitly restricted the expressivity of the language. You'll note that there's a big block of stuff up here uh, and over here that's starting to emerge that's rather different. So we're programming languages people, or you're programming languages people, and I wish that I were a programming languages person. You can laugh at that too. <laughs> I see that the programming languages community has a very well-developed sense of humor. This is great. <coughs> uh, <laughs> you wish they did. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, <coughs> what we would like, though, uh, particularly what we found is as we start to develop models and start to use these things, what ends up happening is that you get, anytime you deal with a domain-specific language or you, you have some sort of restricted language, it's very frustrating if you want to do arbitrary computations or you want to do interesting things or you want to use black box functions or, or something like that. So what we'd like is actually just to be able to use a normal language, C or Java or Clojure or C++ or something like that. Uh, but in so doing, uh, we also, I mean, in, in so doing, we, we would like to be able to, to work with Bayesian non-parametric models or open universe models, basically models that have infinite dimensional parameter spaces or almost sure termination or languages with almost sure termination. We'd like to be able to use discrete and continuous variables. We'd like to be able to use existing libraries. We'd like the language to be easily extensible, all these kinds of things. Of course, we already know, or I've sort of made it relatively clear that, that doing this will have some cost. Namely, inference will be harder and there'll be lots, lots more ways to shoot yourself in the foot. But one can operate in this space, okay? And this is part of the, 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 the design of, the, of, 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 for instance, Anglican, which is one of the languages on which I've worked. <coughs> and here's, a, here's a, just a fun example, application of something that you can do in Anglican that you would have a hard time doing in, 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 a, in, an un, in a restricted language. So um, 
uh, let me say, let me give you the, the, the following task. There's going to be a bunch of balls dropping off of this thing here, and we want to put those balls, actually 20% of them, in the box. Uh, and I'll tell you that what I want you to use, and, and in fact what is being used here, is the JBox 2D physics engine, which is the physics engine behind Angry Birds. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to form this, I'd like to solve this problem using the tools of inference. And then we're going to do this, we'll write a query which says, which is named arrange bumpers. Uh, and it's going to allow us to put some bumper positions in here, then create the world given those bumper positions, which is just an empty vector here. It'll simulate the world to the end using a physics engine that somebody else wrote, thank God for that. Uh, then it will pick up the balls out of some data structure from the end of the world. It'll count how many of them are in the box, and then report uh, the, the balls and the bumper positions so that we can look at the, the visualization afterwards. Okay? Anybody know how to do this using the tools of inference? Roughly. Okay, first step, and this is where it's just really nice to be able to have data structures and unrestricted uh, language constructs and open universe models, so on and so forth, is we might just want to say that there are some number of bumpers, and that might be a sample from a Poisson distribution. Straight away, you know that Poisson has uh, unbounded support, so now we have almost sure termination and all sorts of problems. Uh, straight away, but we'd like to be able to write something like that. A normal user would write something like that. Then we'd like to be able to, 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 to set, some, set up some first class distribution objects, which are the X and Y bumper positions. And then, I mean, why not? Let's use some higher order fu functionality. Let's repeatedly, uh, for some number of times, call an anonymous function which creates a vector of, of uh, X and Y positions. Okay. Fine, nice little language. It puts some, it puts some, it puts some bumper positions out there. Uh, of course, it doesn't solve the task, sorry, uh, because those bumper positions aren't constrained. They're not conditioned on a particular outcome. Now, you should note that I asked for 20% of the balls. There are 20 that are dropped, uh, and it's a deterministic physics simulator. So the inference task here is actually quite hard and would be difficult to do manually. Very, very difficult to do manually. However, Using the tools of conditioning, we can, in fact, actually f frame this as, a, as what's known as a, an approximate Bayesian computation, say that I would like four out of the 20 balls to go in the box, and just observe from that particular distribution the number of balls in the box, introducing a conditioning constraint and yielding uh, a universe or a posterior universe of bumper positions that actually satisfy this criteria. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, the, the, the points of this are, uh, let's see. Um, it's nice to have an unrestricted language so that you can use physics simulators that somebody else wrote for you, and you can use higher order language features to keep your code compact, and you can use data structures, and so on and so forth. It's also nice to be able to actually perform, and it's a demonstration that one can actually perform inference in such unrestricted languages anyway. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> some part of the talk uh, will be about now about how we actually do this, how one can do, uh, one can perform inference in such languages. The next part of the talk will be why doing inference that way stinks. And then the last part of the talk will be uh, how to do it much, much faster. Okay? So, Anglican is one of uh, what we call a higher order probabilistic programming language, uh, which generally, uh, uh, there's a paper coming out, well, it'll be, it'll be clarified a, a lot. Uh, but you can think of it as basically just being uh, a, an unrestricted language. Okay? Having such uh, unrestricted languages allows us, and I wish that I could spend the rest of the time just talking about example applications, because th there are a lot. It's very, it's very fun, actually. Um, it, it gives us a hammer that we can hit all kinds of problems with. Okay? Uh, so if we're doing inference, and again, this is inference, we're looking for the posterior distribution of unknowns given observes, uh, which is basically it's just Bayes' rule in the graphical model here, then we can start thinking about writing all kinds of, of new problems and using the tools of inference to solve them. For instance, uh, if we take program, if we generate program source code and, and condition on its output, what's that? Program synthesis is induction, right? If we... Uh, use a, a graphics engine to generate scenes and then a renderer to generate an image and we condition on an image, that's vision or inverse graphics, right? If we, have a, if we generate a policy and, and stochastic uh, rollouts and we condition on rewards, 
policy learning, control learning, so on and so forth. Cognitive processes observe behavior, so on and so forth. Okay, so people are doing this. There, there's actually many, 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 many papers that are that are coming out doing these kinds of things. But just to just to if uh, if this thinking generatively and using the tools of inference. Uh, Trip, still trips you up just a little bit. Let's let's think about a very simple thing to do. So, uh, can any of you write a program that in, goes from in general capture images like this to the underlying text? How would you do that? <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great, wonderful. Uh, alternatives. If you didn't know about probabilistic programming, even if you do know about probabilistic programming, how do you actually use Anglican to do this? There's not so many people in the audience. This is the nor this is normal class size. People can 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 speak up. This is, I, I, I figured out the programming languages people are the smartest people I've ever known in my life. All of you are sitting there thinking about a solution, right? The, the elephant. Okay, so, all right, so how do you use deep learning? Well, there's a little bit of a, okay, so great. Okay, so great, let's, perfect. Okay, absolutely perfect. So deep learning, so how do we, how do, we do deep learning? What, what are the prerequisites for deep learning? Lots of machines and lots of examples. Screw programming languages, exactly. <laughs> okay, you're right. So one could, for instance, generate a very large number of captures or gather a very large number of captures, hire some, uh, some disadvantaged human being to label those captures, and then train an end-to-end -end system uh, basically regressing from here to there. You'd probably start with a convolutional neural network and probably do pretty well, actually, okay? But that, re that involves labeling, basically having, you know, it, uh, yes, it, exactly, uh, tilling the earth, right, and exploiting under, uh, uh, underrepresented uh, humans, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, let's, let's be real, right? I mean, who wants to label CAPTCHAs? Uh, <coughs> okay, so alternatively, Okay, so okay, so this is this now. Now we're thinking. Okay, so what if we wrote a program that went this way, right? And if that program happened to be really, really, really close, or generate captures that are really, really close to the to the capture of interest, then maybe we can generate synthetic data to plug into such a such a pipeline. That's great. Awesome. All right. So uh, this is step one and step two of the talk. Okay. So step one will be. Well, okay, is Jason's answer, which is uh, we can write generative models, right? So if we can write a generative model and that generative model is okay, we can use the tools of, of probabilistic programming inference to write a program this direction and then invert the program to do that, okay? So writing the program to go this direction is really, really hard. That, I mean, deep learning, there's a reason why deep learning actually is, is, is interesting, powerful, and, and important. Uh, it's because basically we don't know how to write programs like this and it's really nice to be able to have a billion parameters to play around with. Right? and have those fit automatically, the, the program written for you. But writing a program to go this way is easy, right? In fact, you just, you sample some number of characters, you sample a, a character from ASCII, you sample its position, size, style, you sample a capture by sampling some number of characters, again here from Poisson, uh, some noise, and you generate an image. And if you have prob a probabilistic programming system that's unrestricted and allows you to do all this sort of stuff, then you can just simply say, okay, Here's the, here's the query, there's the captcha, there's the, the image that we generated, let's ob observe under some similarity kernel the, generated, the difference between the generative, generated image and the true image, and then just run some sort of inference conditioning on the true image, and what will happen is asymptotically, we will arrive at a, a correct decomposition or a correct uh, um, posterior distribution over the latent, latent strength. Okay, so generative model, inference, result. So we're writing the program in the opposite order and which is easier to reason about, okay? This should give you a sense now. A couple of interesting examples and again I wish I could spend the entire time talking about this. So uh, one is directed procedural graphics. This comes out of uh, our collaborators at, at, at Stanford, Pat Hanrahan, Noah Goodman, and Daniel Ritchie. Daniel has just gone to Brown uh, and, and Noah has just gone to Uber. <coughs> uh, 
so if you want it, no, the, the idea here is basically is, is uh, constrained procedural graphics. So if you want to uh, generate a forest for a, um, for a uh, Hollywood uh, animated movie or something like that, you don't hire a thousand designers, you hire one uh, procedural graphics programmer who writes a, for instance, tree generator. But then if John Lasseter comes in the room and says, I want trees to miss these particular physical objects in this particular scene, one way that I can do that is I can impose a constraint and then ask for the posterior distribution of trees that miss these physical constraints. Okay. Uh, uh, same thing for stable structures. Okay. That seemed to not be so interesting for you guys because you like it hard. Your programming language is people. Let's do something hard then. Uh, so let's say, for instance, and I'm sorry that this is this looks like a Gaussian distribution, uh, but let's say I, I give you this blue empirical distribution, okay? And I say, I want you to write me a piece of code that generates samples that are indistinguishable from this empirical distribution. Okay? Uh, all right, that's hard. But we can use the tools of inference. So this is a little paper that, that one of my uh, uh, master students and I did a, a little while ago. We said, okay, well, Let's solve this using the tools of inference. Let's generate program code, all right? And then condition on the uh, repeated execution of the program generating sample values, the empirical distribution of those sample values passing a KS test statistic or not, not failing a KS test of indistinguishability from this. So what you're getting here is the prior distribution over, over programs and histograms of samples drawn by running those programs repeatedly. And over here you're seeing a, the posterior distribution converging to programs that when repeatedly executed generate uh, uh, samples according to a given distribution. Okay? So this is program synthesis bumped up to uh, 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 generating program text for uh, samplers, actually. Great. Okay. The problem is, of course, the inference is formally hard, right? It's, it's just hard. Uh, so the programming languages community in particular, uh, Ken Shan and his group, uh, and, and in particular with Hacker and Maple, has done some really interesting work. Hong Suk Yang, my, my dear collaborator, has done some of this as well, where basically you can do something to help with, uh, with, with inference by doing some kind of symbolic inference via program transformations, but there's only so far you can go with that because you can always write, particularly in an unrestricted language, a program like this and ask inference to solve it, which I think all of us if you look at this program relatively quickly, would recognize is a, is a difficult inference problem to solve. <laughs> I get more laughs for that. Wow. Great. <laughs> okay. So what's going on? So what, what, what's, what's really going on? <laughs> well, sometimes we still need to solve problems, right? Like there are, there are inference problems that we want to solve. Like there's science that we need to do and so on and so forth. So what can we do? Well, we can... I mean, inference is hard, but we can really, really, really attack all the constant factors effectively. And uh, this is a new way of thinking about it. But I would say that what we've done in, in Anglican is we've, we've attacked all of the, the, the standard compilation programming languages trick kind of constant factors that, 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 you can, that you can eliminate. And we've started to attack and basically have effectively attacked all of the parallelism constant factors that we can get. And then what's left is like being really, really in, uh, creative about inference. So uh, just to give you a sense of how Anglican and, 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 and um, high performance, higher order probabilistic programming languages are implemented, I'll, I'll show you very quickly. What ends up happening is this is an Anglican program here on the, on the right hand side. Anglican is syntactically indistinguishable from cloture. Uh, Anglican is compiled to CPS style cloture, actually, uh, which then can be just in time, as it is always, just in time compiled to JVM bytecode. Uh, what this does is it makes it a couple of things very, very clear. One is it exposes basically an inference back end where Anglican provides fun all of these, these functions in red here, the distributions and um, the observe and predict calls. 
Uh, I should point out that Stanford uh, <laughs> Stanford system converged on the same design, which is a, which is usually a good sign. Uh, so, <laughs> so basically, Anglican controls the execution of a CPS uh, 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 style cloture program uh, by providing generic implementations of these functions, which of course can be compiled ahead of time as well. It also makes cl very clear the notion of a trace and what, we're, what our inference goal is. So a trace in, uh, in, in, a, in one of these systems is just a sequence of some number of observes, n of them, some number of sample statements, and some number of sample values. And conditioned on these sample values, the entire, trace is, the entire computation is deterministic. Great. The trace probability, looks like so. It's just the joint distribution of all the observes and all, all of the observes and all of the latent variables. And this is a product over n uh, observes and m sample statements in a particular trace. And this hides a true dependency structure where everything, uh, uh, all of these variables basically can be conditioned on the entire uh, state of the execution. Okay, So uh, I should point out that this gamma of, of x is the joint distribution. Uh, so that when you see gamma of x over z, this is the target that we're after. Okay, so we've we've got a we've got uh, a, an Anglican program. It gets compiled. Those uh, what we're going to do is is interrupt the execution, the normal execution of a program at a few at a few points. Uh, <laughs> and what we'd like to do is characterize pi of x, or the posterior distribution of x, which is just a renormalization of the joint distribution, such that we can do some sort of Monte Carlo approximation to uh, some expectation of some query under uh, the posterior distribution. And notably, this is going to be expressed like this, basically throughout the, the rest of the talk, which is to say uh, uh, multiplying by one and some sort of importance relationship here. Okay. How many of you have implemented a probabilistic programming system? Okay, great, almost none. So at least at the very end of this, I can give you a sense of how to implement the most brain dead, easy implementation of a probabilistic programming system just to give you a sense of how to do it. And it'll get you thinking about what's, what's going on. So um, the first implementation, which is actually the default implementation in the blog probabilistic programming system, is to run k independent copies of the program simulating from the prior. Okay. So this basically says, ignore all the observes, just run the program forward. Every time you hit a sample statement, draw a value, continue. Okay. However, I need to compute a side effect as the program is running, which is when I hit an observe statement, when, whenever the, the CPS compiled Anglican program reaches an observe, I need to accumulate an unnormalized weight, which is to say the joint distribution over the, uh, uh, the proposal distribution, which given that the proposal distribution here is just run the program forward, uh, all it is is basically keeping track of the, the probability of the observe in that particular trace. That's it. So you hit an observe, you keep track of how, how likely that observe was, great. At the end of the day, we, get, uh, we, get, we normalize those weights and then we can compute a Monte Carlo approximation to the query by just weighting the query evaluated on each of the, each of the traces according to the, the, the normalized weights, okay? That was super, super fast, but it's really straightforward, okay? So um, <clears throat> you have a statement, it's, you have a, a probabilistic program, it's got some sample statements, it's got some observed statements. Run the program k times in parallel, uh, just normally, but let's think about important sampling for a second. Uh, <coughs> in particular, let's think about this. This is the joint distribution. Our Q is just run the program forward. So everything except for the observed statements cancels out. All you're left with are a set of, of, of weights. This thing then is a, is a weighted sum in the, uh, in the Monte Carlo approximation. Done. How many of you could now implement a probabilistic programming system? At five, in those, okay. I've achieved 10, okay, great. The schematic looks like this run the program forward, step out at every observe, accumulate a weight according to the, to the observe statement that you hit. That's it, it's really, really simple, okay? And it turns out it's more powerful than you think. However, this is just the beginning. And I, again, I could spend you know, uh, the next semester talking about all of the general purpose inference algorithms that have been developed for uh, these kinds of languages, but there has been a lot of work on this and we've pushed it pretty far. In fact, pretty much as, I'm pretty comfortable no, I, 
I'm not going to push this any further, okay? Uh, in particular, this interacting particle Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, really removes almost all of the, 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 um, the parallel constant factors you can get. So we've com we have a, a purely compiled probabilistic programming language. Uh, all of the sort of compilation constant factors are out. We execute as fast as the program can go. And basically, we can use as many parallel threads with no latency and almost perfect linear scaling with this inter inter interacting particle Markov chain Monte Carlo. So what we're left with is inference is nasty. What do we do about it? Okay. So this is a, a plug for interacting particle Markov chain Monte Carlo. I would just encourage you, if you're interested in sort of the, the, the state of the art for uh, probabilistic programming uh, uh, inference methods, general purpose inference methods, just to take a look at it. It came out at ICML last year. The problem though, and this is, you know, my slide design hasn't been great so far, but this is really bad. Uh, but let's, let me read this to you. Just close your eyes. This will be a little cone, okay? As, this is written by Andreas Schuhmuller, uh, who's part of NOAA's group uh, at, at, uh, at Stanford. And I think it's really, I think it's powerfully expressive, right? So Bayesian inference is computationally expensive. Even approximate sampling-based algorithms tend to take many iterations before they produce reasonable answers. In contrast, human recognition of words, objects, and scenes is extremely rapid, often taking only a few hundred milliseconds, only enough time for a single pass from perceptual evidence to deeper interpretation. Ah, deep nets, right? Yet human perception and cognition are often well described by probabilistic inference and complex models. Uh-oh, we actually do maintain uncertainty. We actually do reason with uncertainty. We, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh no, how can we re reconcile the speed of recognition with the expense of coherent probabilistic inference? How can we build systems for applications like robotics and medical diagnosis that exhibit similarly rapid performance at challenging inference tasks? Okay, great. So this says, <laughs> we probably, you know, at least are the way, you know, if we're gonna think about AI now, for instance, uh, <coughs> we can think about uh, the, the, the inference we do as, as and the, the decisions we make as being well motivated and well understood and well uh, modeled by Bayesian, uh, by inference in Bayesian models, but we've got a problem, which is inference is fundamentally hard, right? And <clears throat> Andreas wasn't the only person or the first person to, to note, note this. Some relatively famous ge gentlemen like uh, Peter Diane, Jeff Hinton, Radford Neal, Rich Zimmel, for, so on and so forth, thought about this sort of, uh, the, the need for there to be obviously a model of the world. It's pretty clear we have some sort of a model of the world that we simulate, so on and so forth. We have some sort of program that can simulate the world. But we also have some sort of program that instead of going this way, i.e. from generative biases, i.e. our model parameters to the world, we actually have some system that goes from the input and very quickly tells us something about the values of the, the, the latent variables of our, of our simulator, the latent variables, the values of the latent variables in the world. And they called this machine the Helmholtz machine and didn't really tie down all the mathematical details, but you could argue actually that what did was the variational autoencoder that came out relatively recently. How many of you have heard of the variational autoencoder? Okay, if the machine learning community, everyone would have their hand up for sure. And you can think of this as basically a Helmholtz machine realization with one layer of latents, <coughs> reparameterization trick, diagonal Gaussian distributions, and some sort of multi MLP encoder and decoder networks at plus variational inference. But the key idea here is that <coughs> Up here is what we've been talking about, effectively. There is some model that goes from latent variables to observed quantities, okay? And it just so happens that this program happens to be a multi-layer perceptron, which means that in Anglican or some reasonable language, it's like three lines of code. But uh, we're going to use the, the tools of machine learning basically to learn the, you know, the 10 million parameters or whatever of that program. Uh, so basically, we're going to do program induction in this, in this uh, MLP or in this generative model that goes from X to Y. In probabilistic programming, we write this, okay? So this is, this is different. Uh, over here, though, this is the Helmholtz machine idea or the, the amortized inference or compiled inference idea, which is to say we're going to go from our observation, namely a capture image or something like that, directly to the space of the latent variables that we're interested in, okay? And again, this is going to, in their case, be some NLP. Think of it as a program with, free, uh, with, with parameters that need to be learned from data. They're just going to start with data and, and learn this entire, entire pathway. 
at, at about the same time, <laughs> one of my good friends, Tejas Kulkarni, who's now at, at DeepMind, uh, and was with Josh's group and was playing with me when I was visiting their, their, their lab, said, well, we've been working on inverse graphics and inference is slow, and if we want to use inverse graphics for actual applications, like for instance, uh, conditioning on an image and then reconstructing the image as a, as a, um, as a, as a mesh with, with uh, colors and normals and so on and so forth, the latent variables here actually being the geometry and colors of the face, such that then we can re-render it in no a novel pose or with different, with, with different uh, lighting configurations. Well, this looks actually a lot like the variational autoencoder kind of setup. It looks like we can write some sort of graphics code in here. Basically, we can write a renderer that takes these values and generates uh, uh, some image. Uh, <coughs> but if we want to use this in any sort of AI setting or repeated inference setting, we need to be able to get from the observed image to that embedding really, really rapidly. Okay? We, can't, we can't wait for the general purpose inference uh, techniques to, to converge. Right? So I said, well, wait, wait a second. Well, why don't we just actually take advantage of the fact that we have this proposal distribution at our disposal? Right? So I, I went through it pretty quickly. Uh, uh, I have to go pretty quickly. But um, in, we have a choice of how to direct the program. In, in important sampling, we have this, this choice of, of how to... to to tell the program where to go. And if we learn how to, given a, a particular observation, control the program, we can actually do inference really, really fast. So I, I would argue that this deep convolutional inverse graphics network was kind of the first of the probabilistic programming papers to start talking about inference compilation. So <clears throat> they did it in a kind of a hacky way for a single model. What we're trying to do is, is a little bit more general, and I think is pretty, pretty interesting if we, can, if we can get it to work. And honestly, this mostly is, is me asking you guys to, to help, because there's a lot of questions here that are, that are starting to get opened up, and it's going to be a lot of fun trying to solve them. So what we'd like for inference compilation is to denote a model and inference problem as a probabilistic, in a, as a, yeah, as a probabilistic programming language program. So standard setup. Then we'd like to be able to press compile and, and wait for a little while. Uh, ideally not this long, but that's how long it takes right now, depending on the problem. And then we get some sort of compilation artifact. And I really do mean compilation here. So what, I, what, what we're trying to do is we want to go from a probabilistic program to the source code of a neural net program in TensorFlow or PyTorch or something like that, and I, I, plus the weights. Okay. So the weights are just some file of values for the variable. So basically, I want the complete neural net description for the, uh, <clears throat> for the encoder. Okay? So I'll call that the compilation artifact. And I'll call it a controller because we're going to use this in forward inference of the kind that I, that, I, that I talked about for important sampling or likelihood weighting that enables fast repeated inference in the original model that is compatible with exact, asymptotically exact inference. So not... Uh, variational inference, although we could do that. I really want to be able to, to, to do exact inference in the model. And ideally, what we'd get out of this is actually a, a, a model-based submodule that we can stick in into AI pipelines. So pro diagrammatically, it looks like this. We're going to write our probabilistic program in our favorite language, whatever that happens to be. Uh, actually, we've started using C plus, uh, CPProb, which is going to come out of the, the group relatively soon, so we've been using C++ here. Uh, um, <laughs> quite a bit, or Anglican. I'll show you some uh, Anglican pseudocode examples here. And what we'd like to do is something akin to the suggestions that were made before, which is we'd like to generate from that uh, program a bunch of training data. We have the joint distribution. The program gener specifies the joint distribution, x, y, pairs. We'd like to automatically generate a neural net architecture that corresponds to this program in some sort of nice way. Then we'd like to train that neural network to, to not just have its programmatic structure, but also its weights, by minimizing some KL divergence, which corresponds to basically learning an optimal importance sampler for, uh, uh, on average, over all possible lies. We get this compilation artifact, and then at test time, we should be able to do very, very fast inference using that, that artifact. Okay, everybody get the, get the picture? Uh, okay, the, okay, great. So this is a good, that's actually a remarkably good question. Uh, so um, <laughs> I said that I want to be able to do 
asymptotically exact inference in the model, whatever the model happens to be. So uh, when we perform inference, we're actually going to be performing inference in the program, in the, 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 the distribution specified by the program. So in fact, what we're going to be doing is we're still going to actually be running the probabilistic program. We're still going to be doing probabilistic programming inference. We are not simply going to be giving the regression output, but instead we're going to be controlling the program so as to perform inference in the program. And I'll give one example at the very, very end as to why we might want to do that. Uh, but this does actually correspond exactly to the notion to, to or not, not exactly, it's very cl it smells close in spirit to a bunch of the recent breakthroughs in deep learning, like uh, the multi-digit number recognition from Street View imagery, where Basically, they made a bunch of synthetic data in order to, to train a neural net to solve this problem. Also, the first paper, paper that broke CAPTCHA, by the way, was from the people who make CAPTCHAs, right? So they didn't have to label them. They actually had the CAPTCHA generating mechanism. So great, they just make a bunch of labeled training data. And of course, out of uh, the uh, Zisserman group, there's been a bunch of uh, uh, neural networks for natural scene text recognition and for uh, text localization and natural images. And the, the, the idea here is we have some generative model. Uh, we can generate data from it. If that generative model matches the, the, the real data in some sort of way, then, any, then there's evidence that deep neural networks can perform some kind of inference. Like they, they can take something, some nonlinear factor off of the, off of the, the cost of inference. And uh, I think this is not, not well understood. Uh, but there's proof of concept that it works, and uh, although these guys don't think about doing inference and they're not, they don't recognize that the models that they make actually are models in which one can then perform inference and account for uncertainty, we're going to do that uh, all the way through. We're going to start with graphical models uh, and give you a flavor of what's going on, and then we'll do the higher order stuff and then, and then wrap up. How am I doing on time? Over? I have five minutes left or five minutes over? Five minutes left, okay. Uh, so graphical model inference. So this is the same, what, huh? <laughs> uh, so, <coughs> so um, let's, let's think about graphical models. So th the joint distribution of a graphical model is, it can be decomposed like this for any arbitrary uh, sets of x's and y's. All I'm, going, all I'm saying here is this is basically the same as the prob prog setup. We're just going to be in the, in the bugs case of, of a restricted language where there are only a finite number of graphs, a uh, finite number of, of, of edges. If we say, for instance, want to use important sampling to do inference in such a model or sequential Monte Carlo, then we approximate as we have so far the posterior as weighted samples. So here's the posterior distribution, here's the weights, and the weights arise from basically being the unnormalized weights are basically the joint distribution over some proposal distribution, where that proposal distribution has some parameter lambda. Uh, great. The performance of this kind of inference, as performance in important sampling always does, uh, <clears throat> depends very, very heavily on, on, on how good this proposal Q is. Great. So there's lots of, uh, lots of stuff in the statistics community on learning a proposal for a single data set. So if we have some target de density, which is the posterior distribution and some approximating family Q of X given lambda, then for a single data set, i.e. a single inference task, we want to do one inference, uh, then you might want to argument over lambda the KL divergence between the posterior and Q with respect to lambda, choosing uh, the KL divergence in this direction for, for various reasons, namely because Q is on the bottom and we want to make sure that it's not, uh, that it's bigger than P everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> great. So this is one way to get to uh, a notion of an optimal important sampling proposal. Well, what we noticed, uh, and it's, it's, it, this is pretty well known, it's, not, it's, it's almost trivial actually, is that if we make lambda a function of the observed quantities, then we can average over the distribution of, 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 of observed quantities and at, attempt to minimize that KL divergence averaging over all the data that could be drawn from the model or all the observable data from the model. So now let's think of phi here as being some neural net parameterized by eta and the, the observed quantities. In fact, it's going to be parameterized by a little bit more than that. Um, 
uh, then we can think of this upper level uh, objective as basically being the average of this KL divergence over all lies. If we write the KL divergence out, this comes out to be an, an expectation, this is, this is the whole thing right here, an expectation over the joint distribution of minus log Q of X given phi eta Y, okay? So this says, if I have the joint distribution, or if I have a model, for instance, that generates, the, from which I can generate samples from the joint distribution, and I have some sort of neural artifact that's able to produce parameters for the distributions of this uh, encountered at every sample statement as the program runs forward, <coughs> I basically can learn a controller that says, the program, in order to generate observation Y must have run this way at this particular sample statement, at this particular choice, okay? Let that sink in for a second, okay? It's pretty cool. So we're gonna learn a controller effectively that knows how to map from Y, so I'm gonna give it a new Y, and it says, uh, because I've experienced a whole lot of Ys, I know the model, I know how the program must have run, then I can just start and say, well, the first random choice of the program in order to generate this Y must have come from this distribution. And in fact, that distribution is going to be close to the posterior distribution because if it weren't, then you're in trouble, right? So let's look at how this works. So <clears throat> this ICML paper, Inference Networks for Sequential Monte Carlo and Graphical Models, which is really actually a probabilistic programming paper, but in machine learning, if you, well, that's a hard, let's, let's not talk about that. Um, <laughs> we did something where we took graphical models, like for instance, a, a heavy-tailed non-conjugate uh, regression model uh, uh, with Laplace priors and the weights and student T observations, and then used basically a minimal IMAP preserving transformation to automatically transform the graphical model. So in other words, think bugs to this, uh, bugs program to this, transform the bugs, uh, the, the graphical model into a new graphical model that runs backwards from the observations. So it actually all the arrows start from the observations and run backwards, okay? Great, so we have this, and then we, ha we in this help please programming language community, there's a bit of hand stuff that happened in this particular case in order to build a neural net proposal, okay? But this is largely to give you a sense of what's going on because I'm going to move to the Anglican case right after this. So, <clears throat> Here's an example of what, what can happen. So again, this is a polynomial regression model. On the left here is the ground truth posterior having looked at the prior, and you can't see the prior here. It's extremely diffuse. It's all over the place. Um, but basically, every row here is a new data set, a data set that was never seen in training. It was never, uh, uh, it's just, it's new, okay? It's, I say, I've given you this co compilation artifact. I want you to perform inference given my new data Y, okay? So the black dots are the new data Y. This is the proposal distribution that comes out of the trained artifact, okay? So uh, basically this is a one-shot structured inversion of the probabilistic program that does a pretty decent job of capturing the uncertainty that's actually there, the true posterior distribution. However, because we do this in an important sampling setup, we actually have the ability to clean those up by importance weights and get very, very high fidelity approximations to the true, the true posterior. In a feed-forward one-shot computation that was trained by compiling the probabilistic program to a neural net uh, structure and weights. Okay, wow can't see those at all. So how do we do this for higher order programs? I haven't talked about a bunch of the gory details. Okay, I, I, okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll skip this and say, we can do this for higher order probabilistic programs, basically by training something that goes forward, okay? And it involves some crazy neural network stuff, stacked LSTM, blah, 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 crazy stuff, polymorphing, so, so on and so forth. It's implemented, it's Anglican plus torch, zero MQ, and what we get is some pretty cool stuff. So if we have an open universe Gaussian mixture model, we get instantaneous inference. Counting, localization, means, covariances, the full deal. One shot straight away. That's basically what, 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 what this shows. Uh, here's what happens. It takes, we've got a rule of thumb. It basically takes as many examples as there are random variables or, or, uh, or uh, uh, 
basically we need to, to train using as many traces as there are free parameters in the neural networks, but here we have some visual object challenge counting and classification of object detections, and we get true posterior uncertainties over the number and, and positions of objects in the scene. Again, a single shot inference, but maybe just to give you a sense because we talked about CAPTCHA a little bit. So we wrote the same CAPTCHA program and we trained up an artifact to perform inference in this structured program. Uh, and the, the, <laughs> the, in, the compiled inference artifact achieves breaking rates like this. Its one shot breaks are at human perception speed. And basically you can look at the amount of training data that's required in order to actually compile this probabilistic program into a feed forward fast inference engine. And at a few tens of millions, things look, look pretty good. Why do we want to do inference in models? Well, there are some models that we b believe. So where are we going with this? So uh, we've just started a big collaboration. So this does scale. We've got, there's really some fun stuff we can do. So for instance, if we want to understand what's going on in the, in the, in the world of physics, well, it turns out that there's some, a program called Sherpa and a program called Jayant. Sherpa j simulates the standard model. It is correct. Right? Uh, Jayant simulates the Atlas detector. It is correct. It is the model in which you want to do inference. Right? You're going to get some I I event signature, and you'd like to under un understand what happened through the program. You'd like to do inference in the program very, very rapidly to figure out what event happened. So we're, we're starting to play with that now. Um, so that's, that's more or less it. Prog prog, it's here. It works. We can denote joint distribution of infinite problems. It's practical. It's actually becoming widely used. We could talk about that a bunch. It opens up a lot of interesting problems for this community and beyond. Uh, inference is hard. Don't let that stop you because there are ways that we can get around it by, by uh, doing inference compilation and leveraging all the tricks and tools from the deep learning community. So there's a bunch of people I'd like to thank. Jan Willem, Brooks Page, David Tolpin, Hong Sak Yang, uh, Ganesh Biden, Tuan Le, Tom Rainforth. And uh, please, if you're interested in coming to work, uh, there's a really interesting program where we're going to put all these tools to work, uh, and I'm, I'm hiring. So thank you very much. You should tell them. Now's the time to tell them. Oh, yeah. So one more thing here I didn't tell you in the beginning. Did you hear this, by the way? Maybe. <laughs> so uh, Frank actually uh, had uh, appendicitis surgery on Saturday. And uh, he really, really wanted to come here to talk to you guys. And uh, really, really didn't want to cancel the, the engagement. So really, I'm uh, super impressed uh, by what he did coming here, flying here from London. So let's uh, thank Frank again, actually. <laughs> so now, a couple of questions. Anybody has questions? Anybody want to see the hole? <laughs> you can come there or you can raise your hand. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, one question. Uh, I've observed that most of your um, examples are related to image processing. So evaluation of image, you are training, uh, you are using images to train data. So have you tried um, t uh, evaluating your tool, I mean using your tool on say Google Maps of a particular scale, all Google Maps of a particular scale? Reason, the reason I, why I'm asking is that uh, when we are talking about programs with a reasonable size and a reasonable amount of data, we are talking about uh, a space that is, let's say, comparable with Google Maps uh, at a, I don't know, a particular scale which is uh, human readable. So is my question clear? Uh, what's the problem you're trying to solve? I'm not trying to solve a problem. I'm trying to understand the scalability of your tool. Okay, uh, great. I, I think I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll answer it in the following way. So, uh, so don't don't be confused. And this is, this this goes for for all of you. Uh, one of the reasons to show um, it, it, programs that are, that generate images 
uh, when giving a talk is that you're giving a talk and the program generates images and it's interesting to, to show results for that. It's a good, good, good slide material. The, the aim here is uh, much, much broader and the kinds of models that we're compiling are much, much more interesting uh, than, than what I'm able to show on, on slides. So all of, the, all of the stuff that we do with automata induction and program induction and these kinds of things um, are, are accessible and amenable to the techniques that we're talking about. Now, your question about scalability, there's all kinds of questions to, to ask here. Uh, you know, um, what, 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 how big of uh, latent variable space? Well, that doesn't even make sense because we're dealing with infinite dimensional latent variable spaces. How much training data do you need? What's the, the neural net architecture? How do, I, uh, who knows? Uh, really, honestly, that's, that, that's really, really the answer. What, we're, what I can say is basically any, any program that we've written in Anglican, whether it's automata induction or, or, uh, or PCA or uh, so on and so forth, we're able to use these techniques successfully, provided that we find a reasonable embedding. And the embedding, that's, that's an, interesting, an interesting question. And where, you know, the, this is actually asking a bunch of deep learning questions as well, like what's, what's actually doing the work of inverting the program? Is it the LSTM, is it the embedder, is it, who knows? Uh, uh, we don't know. This is very, very recent work and I, uh, it's, I'd like to engage with you guys about it. So your, your talk was basically an invitation for this community to work on these problems. But your final slide was, things are hard, we need your help. Could you break it down one or two levels, finer grain? <laughs> what specific things <coughs> are out there that are possibly tractable that this community might uh, have some techniques? So, so this, is, this is a really good question. I assume everybody could hear it. Um, uh, so. I went back and forth on whether or not to leave in a slide like that, whether or not it would be fair to my postdocs and students to give out all the good ideas or to, um, so there are, um, there are a number of, okay, there are a number of loose ends here that really need, need tidying up in a, in a sort of a formalized good way. Uh, one is, it's really, in, in, in say for instance, here's, here's one of them. In the graphical modeling world, it's relatively clear how you can take a, a, a dependency structure. In fact, it's well known. You can look it up in Col uh, 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 Friedman and, and Kohler. You can take a graphical model structure uh, and invert all of the edges and prove uh, properties about basically the, the conditional independencies that are preserved or not preserved between those two. So you can take a program, like a bugs program, turn it into a graphical model, turn that into another graphical model that, that, that has provably preserved properties, and then well, okay, that's great, but then you still actually have to be able to come up with the structure of a, of a neural net program that's sufficiently expressive to preserve those properties, okay? So that last transformation there, don't know, that's, that, that's hard. And it's much, much harder when you have one of these higher order languages where you don't have the ability to actually invert, the pro actually explicitly invert the dependencies in the program. You have to somehow derive uh, the structure of the neural net program from the structure of the original program, and that's a programming language challenge. If I've if I've if I've ever if I've ever seen one, if if that makes any sense. So uh, so I, I give you an I give you an arbitrary Anglican program, and I want you to to give me the structure of a neural net uh, that will invert that program. Um, so, first off, I just want to thank you for the talk. It was a fascinating, um, fascinating topic and, and something that's uh, really interesting to me in particular as someone who has, has studied PL in the past and is now sort of jumping on the machine learning bandwagon um, and, and, as you say, learning to stop worrying and love deep, deep neural networks. Um, I've been really curious in particular about um, a lot of the literature in deep neural networks in particular on uh, sort of deep neural networks with more advanced structure. So like recurrent networks, um, networks with sort of variable processing components, uh, networks with attention models that can look at the input multiple times, look at different parts of the input. It strikes me in the context of your talk as accomplishing something akin to 
taking the initial posterior estimate and refining it. And I wonder if you've looked at that connection at all, and in particular, you know, whether you can improve those techniques to make them more like inference or vice versa. Um, and, and what are your thoughts on developing those, those ideas further? <laughs> I, I think I'll combine the, the answer. This, uh, thank you for your kind words. And uh, I think I'll combine my answer to that with a, a continuing answer to, to, to this, which is to say that there's, I mean, what's going on with deep networks is, is really pretty, pretty interesting, which is, uh, you know, it used to drive me crazy that the deep, deep networking co community would say, we are doing inference. Right, so we're going from some observer space, and we're inferring, you know, the class of something or whatever. And I was like, ah, oh, that's not inference, but in fact, it it, it actually kind of is, right? Um, now the question is, uh, these these the the structure of the, you know, obviously nobody knows anything about how to to actually programmatically derive the structure of these things, but uh, I, I think it, I think working towards that. You, you might get a larger, you, you might get some leverage from this, this perspective saying there is actually some generative model. The thing that we actually want to do inference in is structured in some kind of a way. Can I use that, the structure of the, the model that I have in mind to inform the structure of the inference network? Absolutely. So another, another you, you mentioned attention mechanisms. So, so we, I didn't mention at all, I didn't talk at all about addresses. This is something I always have to gloss over because it's incredibly, incredibly gross and you'll, you'll appreciate it, right? Where does a sample statement take place in the execution of a, of a program, right? I need to be able to identify every single one of those perfectly. So there's an addressing scheme that comes along and there's you, every, every execution is freighted with an address, right? Okay, but every inverse execution has to make a prediction at every address, and everything that's in scope may actually affect that, right? So, but which variables in scope would be useful for making some sort of statement about the inverse? I don't know. So we, we actually need attention models even in the deep neural networks in order to, 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 to figure out which part of this, the variables in scope could actually influence its, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's take the rest of the questions offline. Uh, Frank will be around today and tomorrow, so you can come down and talk to him if you have more questions, if you want to discuss with him. Uh, so let's thank uh, Frank again for the great talk.